Good evening. My name is Bria Baker. I'm a senior in Saybrook College and the president of Yale's chapter of the NAACP. And I would like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's keynote on Making Black Dreams Matter. I am so excited to welcome back President Brooks, the national president of the NAACP, who graduated from Yale Law School and spoke from this same pulpit commemorating MLK while he was a student. The theme of tonight and this week in general is the work continues making black dreams matter. Last semester, we witnessed this firsthand here at Yale and at Mizu and Princeton and many other institutions of higher education. But youth activism has not been exclusive to college campuses. And we also saw the efforts of youth in Chicago, Ohio, and Texas. Across this nation, youth are coming together to continue the amazing work of the heroes before us. And there is no greater way to honor King's legacy than by continuing towards the realization of his dream. In his speech, I've been to the mountaintop, King made an important comment. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up. He concluded that speech with let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination and let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be. Let us not just remember King on his birthday or during Black History Month. Let us remember him in mobilizing. Let us remember him through the efforts of Next Yale. Let us remember him by exerting our freedom of speech to challenge what we know to be unjust. And let us remember him in refusing to shy away from the very important conversations of inclusion, diversity, and racial equality, not just for African Americans, but also for those of Native, Latinx, and Asian descent. We are the next wave of the movement, and that is why I am so thankful to you all for coming tonight to hear from President Brooks on the work that began all those years ago and how that continues with us. So without further ado, I will turn the program over to Shades of Yale, the co-ed a cappella group and resident group of the Afro-American Cultural Center that draws on the rich ethnic and musical backgrounds of its members with a focus on the music of the African diaspora. After their performance, we will have Jonathan Holloway, Dean of Yale College, Edmund S. Morgan Professor of African American Studies and Professor of History and of American Studies to introduce our speaker, President Cornell William Brooks. Thank you.
To paraphrase James Baldwin, if the Father can teach us to say, yes, Lord, the children can learn that most precious word. Amen. Thank you, Yale, Shades of Yale. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Holloway. I'm Dean of Yale College. I send greetings from Peter Salovey, the president of the institution, who desperately wishes he could be here. When he found that his schedule did not align with his event, uh, I believe he spent about an hour on the phone talking with our guest speaker. That's right, right? Yeah, just wanting to, maybe a little more, in fact. Um, uh, I don't know the context of that conversation, uh, but um, President Salovey uh, wanted to make clear that he wishes he were here in this moment. He's right now out of the country. I like to think he's with us all the same. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to Yale University generally and to Battelle Chapel specifically for the 2016 Martin Luther King Jr. keynote address. Our speaker on this occasion is the Reverend Cornell William Brooks, President and CEO of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Before I go into a proper introduction for our guest speaker, it is important to note that Reverend Brooks, Brooks will be addressing us from the same podium Martin Luther King Jr. used when he came to campus. King visited Yale on two separate occasions, once in 1959 when he spoke on the future of integration, and again in 1964 when he received an honorary degree. If alumni were curious about King's first visit, an unsettling number were horrified when then President Kingman Brewster would deign to bestow upon King Yale's highest honor. Yes, some reporters and newspapers hailed Brewster's actions, but others lamented that Yale was honoring, quote, a petty criminal. King, it is important to note, had arrived in New Haven only two days after being released from a Florida jail where he was being held for ordering food in a whites-only hotel. Was Yale a place that affirmed the actions of a petty criminal? Brewster replied to those who questioned the direction of the institutional's ethical compass in the following manner. Our educational, our educational as well as moral obligation is to reaffirm the ideals we believe in. He added, the effort to cure racial injustice should not be allowed to fester into war between the races. Therefore, it is especially important for the institutional symbols of white privilege to let it be known that they share this cause. Brewster, as you know, was writing during a moment when the nation was engaged in a conversation about race, civil rights, and citizenship that demanded a new language if we were to understand who we were as a nation. This is over 50 years ago, lest we forget. And yet here we are in 2016, seven years into the presidency of the first African American to hold that office, in a moment when we can open up our newspapers, read Twitter feeds, turn on the television, and scan social media, and sadly wonder, haven't we gone through this already? What happened to the promise of King's dream? What has come of the decades of work that so many of our grandparents, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles pursued in the hope that a future they might not ever see would look different from the present that they knew? These are the questions that we ask today that so many are, were asking in this very same space, literally this very same space just two months ago. Thank goodness then that we have someone like Reverend Brooks who can offer us guidance. Thank goodness, then, that we have as our guest someone who can talk to us about our present challenges, who can ground them in a vernacular informed by politics and by faith, and who can speak with personal experience about the journey that, for many, is translated into what is known as the American dream. I look across our landscape, and I see that we are in need of translators in this moment. One, when we spend too much time, sometimes it feels like all of the time, talking past each other. Reverend Brooks is such a person, and I thank goodness again that he is with us today. In 2014, Reverend Brooks became the chief executive of the NAACP. He is by training and by inclination a civil rights attorney, a social justice advocate, a coalition builder, and a fourth generation ordained minister. He earned a Bachelor of Arts with honors in political science from Jackson State University and a Master of Divinity from Boston University's School of Theology with a concentration in social ethics and systematic theology. After seminary, Brooks earned a Juris Doctorate from Yale Law School where he served as a senior editor of the Yale Law Journal and member of the Yale Law and Policy Review. 
While studying at Boston University as a Martin Luther King scholar, Brooks is awarded both the Oxnam Leibman Fellowship for Outstanding Scholarship and, and Promoting Racial Harmony and the Jefferson Fellowship for Outstanding Scholarship and Excellence in Preaching. Prior to joining the NAACP, Brooks led the Newark-based New Jersey Institute for Social Justice as president and CEO. There, he directed the Institute's successful efforts to win the passage of prisoner reentry bills. He developed workforce training programs for low-income, hard-to-employ residents. He served the people. He laid the foundation so that others could rebuild their lives as productive and responsible citizens. In all of this work, he served as a model for the kind of sacrifice and vision that we associate with Martin Luther King, Jr. I also like to think that he served as a model for the kind of person Yale aspires to send out into this world. So please, join me in welcoming home Reverend Cornell Brooks. Good evening. It is such a delight and humbling honor to be here in a place that I called home for three years. Now, the last time I was in this pulpit uh, preaching the Martin Luther King commemorative uh, sermon, it occurred two days before one of my exams at Yale Law School. So I arrive at this moment slightly less stressed. <laughs> uh, this evening, there is a formal portion of the program uh, that speakers like to call acknowledgments. It can sometimes be a formulaic rec recitation of names. But because I come out of the African-American church tradition, I see it as an opportunity to express appreciation for people for their extraordinary hospitality. First on that list would be the students of Yale University. Because of you, your activism, your prophetic voice, your standing within this community and in the country, I am here to be with you. Thank you. I want to express appreciation to President Salovey for extending to me this wonderful opportunity to be here uh, and express appreciation to his, as we would say in my church, uh, his bride, uh, Marta, uh, for not only opening up a pulpit, but also opening up their home as well. Thank you. <laughs> to the dean, members of the faculty, uh, certainly the faculty of Yale Law School, uh, one of whom I know is uh, present here, uh, Jay Pottinger, um, I want to express my appreciation. I certainly want to express my appreciation to the Martin Luther King Planning Committee. I understand how much work goes into bringing together a cross-section of the community within Yale, but also beyond. So I want to say thank you. I also want to thank the university chaplain, uh, Reverend Kugler and her staff. And I also want to thank uh, the Afro-Am House. Now here's why, brothers and sisters. Uh, before I arrived at Battelle Chapel, that was my senior, or rather third year at Yale Law School. My first year at Yale Law School, there's a wonderful organization at Yale called the Black Church at Yale. Uh, they extended an invitation to me, untried and untested, to preach on a Sunday morning. There were maybe 30 or so people there at the beginning of that modest sermon, I think there were one or two at the end. <laughs> I want to just say uh, thank you to, um, to the staff 
and certainly uh, Risa Nelson for her hospitality. Uh, please also allow me to extend appreciation to Michael Moran, who has been a friend to the NAACP uh, since my freshman year at the NAACP. I'm a first semester sophomore. So uh, thank you for your great work and your great support of the NAACP. Now, uh, my uh, fellow uh, Yale uh, alum and students, there's a large, generally raucous group of people uh, in this house who represent the nation's premier advocates for social justice. Uh, they would be the members of the NAACP. Uh, we have in their house the president of the state conference, uh, President Exdale. If I could just ask you to stand. Can you put your hands together? Uh, members of the state executive committee, could you just please stand? Thank you. Now, they didn't come here alone. There are branch presidents from all across Connecticut, as well as folks representing our youth in college division, of one of whom is Bree. I'm going to ask that our branch presidents, as well as the rank and file membership of the NAACP, whether you're on campus in Connecticut or from any place else in the country, if you could just stand on your feet here in Battelle Chapel and let the people know who you are and who you represent. Can you put your hands together? Now, before I proceed to my modest remarks, uh, I'd like to share with you a true story. Now, this being a pulpit and not a witness stand, it is true in the sermonic and metaphorical sense, which is to say generally true. <laughs> my first year at Yale Law School, I had the opportunity to travel to London, England, uh, to do a human rights internship. But while I was there, I was extended an opportunity to preach at one of the great cathedrals of Europe, or so I thought. So I found myself on a Sunday morning standing outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral with spires soaring up toward the heavens beautiful stained glass windows reflecting the multi-hued, multi-colored, iridescent beauty of God. And standing outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral on a Sunday morning as a young, naive, presumptuous preacher, I suppose, presuppose that there were about 2,000 or so people inside waiting to hear this young, naive, presumptuous preacher preach. As I made my way into the sanctuary, I immediately noticed the obvious. The pastor and exactly two members. True story. One member I'll call Miss Jones. The other member I'll call Miss Smith. Now as I was preaching, I immediately noticed the obvious that Miss Jones immediately fell asleep. True story. But as I was preaching, I also noticed that Miss Smith seemed to hang on to every word I had to say. She nodded her head, she clapped her hands, she tapped her feet, she said hallelujah and amen at all the right liturgical and theological moments, and I thought to myself on this Sunday morning, at least I'm reaching one somebody. So I concluded my modest little homily, made my way out of the pulpit, made my way to the side of the pastor, and the pastor said to me, Brother Brooks, I am just so sorry. Miss Jones, she falls asleep on everybody. And Miss Smith, she's out of her mind and did not understand a thing you had to say. <laughs> so you can see why I'm so delighted to be back here at Yale amidst this distinguished congregation where there's so many people who are wide awake and presumably in your right minds. <laughs> True story. On this evening, in the still silence, amidst the powerful reverence 
of this magnificently beautiful sanctuary. Many of us recall the moment we first heard the mellifluent words and the melodious voice of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On this evening, the memory of his voice yet tingles the skin stirs the soul, quickens the conscience, and speaks to the very depth of who we are as a nation, who we are as a community, who we are as a people amidst this tumultuous time we find ourselves in. On this evening, hearing these words within our hearts, I have a dream, gives golden wings to our moral imagination, even at this moment in which the proposition Black Lives Matter is questioned and doubted. Even at this moment, on college campuses across the length and breadth of this republic, the sincerity, the democratic intentions the moral impulse of a generation of students is being called into question even at this moment. On this evening, listening to his legacy, hearing the trumpet of history in our hearts, our hearts yet declare that Dr. King's voice was and is peculiarly persuasive spiritually distinctive, morally unambiguous, if not morally unique. This evening, we still wonder, we still, as a matter of moral curiosity, ask ourselves, what was it? What is it about his voice that yet speaks to us now? In this moment, in this place, among this generation of students who are blessed with a prophetic spirit. His voice possessed the melodious power of Leontine Price and Paul Robeson, and yet that voice transcends song. His voice lifted up lyrical truths like the English bard William Shakespeare or the black bard Langston Hughes. And yet that voice cannot be constrained and confined within the perimeters of poetry. His voice yet moves our spirits like the pastoral symphony and causes our, hand, our hands to clap like the Negro spirituals. And yet that voice even this evening, amidst this violent time, this tumultuous time, this trepidatious time, this anxiety-filled time, this moment in which we question ourselves as older people and younger people, as a Moses generation and a Joshua generation, even at this time, in this moment, we ask ourselves the question, why? Does Dr. King's voice resonate and reverberate with particularity of relevance? The conductor Arturo Toscanini said of the African-American soprano Marian Anderson, her voice was a voice that comes but once in human history. And yet, those of you who are scholars of American rhetoric, those of you who are scholars of American theology, those of you who are scholars of moral philosophy, those of you who are well-read, well-versed students at Yale understand that his voice may well be one that comes but once in human history. And yet that voice, I want to suggest to you, was a mere echo of the voice of God in human history. Why was his voice so special? Why is it on an evening like tonight, 
We're gathering as a, a cross section of humanity. And all of our foible field and flawed humanity. We come together, diverse in our beauty, diverse in the fragility of our brokenness. We come together to glimpse and glean his wisdom. Why? What was it? What is it about the voice of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? I want to suggest to you, particularly those of you who are students, who feel a particularly heavy burden, the timeliness of this moment, the weight of history on your shoulders, with the experience that you have and with the experience that you're yet to gain, I want to suggest to you that his voice was special because it is and was the voice of a prophet. And if you came here this evening yearning to hear something that might encourage your word, encourage your work, give you power in failing moments, give you strength when you feel weak. And if you're like me, a little older, charged with a different set of responsibilities, maybe you want to hear the secret of his voice. I believe there are instructive words found in the book of Isaiah. And though this is not a sermon, I'd like to encourage you to hear what another prophet said that inspired the work of Dr. King. In the book of Isaiah, in the sixth chapter, we find these words of prophetic power. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple above him, stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled and full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim to me, having in his hand a burning coal, which he taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. And I've heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then the Lord said, or rather he said, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. Just for a few moments, as a meditation of encouragement, I want to reflect on three themes. The first of which is, with the vision comes the voice. With the vision comes the voice. The second theme I'd like to reflect on is quite simply flawed but cold, flawed, but cold. And the third theme I'd like to reflect on with you is there are prophets among us. There are prophets among us. 
My brothers and sisters in this social justice struggle, my friends in the NAACP family, and those of you in my Yale family, I encourage you to think about a prophet by the name of Isaiah. The eighth century prophet by virtue of power and privilege, pedigree and background was meritocratically qualified to be in the proximity of power as a counselor or an advisor. Former Dean Anthony Cronman, in a book he wrote about the role of lawyers, spoke about lawyers as statesmen, advisors, counselors to those in power. Whereas Isaiah, a graduate of Yale College, he might have gone on to Yale Law School and become a well-connected lawyer, giving advice to the powerful. Were he a graduate of Yale College, he might have gone on to the School of Management and become a management consultant and advise those captains of industry. But the text doesn't tell us that that's quite what happened. The text tells us that Isaiah, in the year King Uzziah, caught a vision and in this vision, he saw the Lord on the throne high and lifted up. And the text tells us, theological history tells us, that as a consequence of seeing this vision, getting beyond his, his, his nearsightedness in his humanity, he glimpsed he glimpsed God, and as a consequence, he was inaugurated as a prophet because he had a vision. He was no ordinary prophet. Within the Jewish traditions, he stands slightly below Moses. His words are lifted up in the morning service. In the Christian tradition, he is his words are quoted over 50 times in what we call the New Testament. He is a prophet of magisterial and magnificent power. But the question you have to ask yourself this evening is what does that have to do with the relevance and the urgency of Dr. King's message on the campus of Yale University amidst the throes of what we're grappling with in terms of diversity? the generational divide, I dare say racial and ethnic distrust. And as these students who grew up in the age of Obama did not arrive on this campus as mere scholars. They arrived on this campus as citizens of this republic. They arrived on this campus in the midst of Ferguson. They arrived on this campus in the midst of Tamir Rice. They arrived on this campus in the midst of Freddie Gray. They arrived on this campus in the midst of a social justice revolution. And so as a consequence, you might be asking yourself, what does Isaiah say about the power of Dr. King's voice? Dr. King, in the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech, not the I have a strategic plan speech, not the I have a set of objectives and policy goals that I'd like to discuss with you as a nation speech, but the I have a dream speech translated and transliterated into ordinary English, I have a prophetic vision speech. And in this speech, he invoked the words of the prophet Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Amos, 
the predecessor and the spiritual godfather of Isaiah. There's a lesson here for you young prophets. You have to glimpse a vision that's bigger than yourself, even bigger than your generation. Now, I offer this lesson not because I'm making any generational assumptions that I have some wisdom to offer you, but I'm speaking out of my own brokenness. I'm speaking out of my own vulnerability. I'm speaking out of my experience as a freshman CEO after one week of orientation, having Staten Island and Eric Garner happen my second week on the job, then Ferguson, then the Charleston Nine, students of scripture being assassinated in my church. And here I am in my first semester of my sophomore year as president and CEO of the NAACP. I come to you in my brokenness, in my fragility, in moral humility, saying that there are times when I've got to lean on the wisdom of the ages. It's hard to speak with power. It's hard to speak with courage. It's hard to speak with moral authenticity, transparency, and sincerity. It's hard to confront your enemies, to confront your opponents, recognizing that in them are weaknesses, foibles, faults, what the old folks called sin that you may well find in yourself. Can I be real with you? After the non-indictment in Ferguson of the killer of Michael Brown, the NAACP announced a march from Ferguson to Jefferson City, Missouri, from the home of Michael Brown to the home of the governor, a journey of 134 miles. Your CEO, not being a particularly gifted student of geography, didn't realize that once you leave St. Louis, it's all uphill. Your president, not being a particularly skilled climatologist, called for the march in December. In ice storms, in cold, wondering whether or not I did the right thing, spoke up at the right time, spoke with clarity of vision, Wondering whether or not my voice was sufficiently powerful and authentic. Being ambushed by the Klan. Having the local police decline to provide protection. And the state police politely ignoring our plea. My voice feeling fragile and shaky and broken. We arrived in a little town called Rosebud, Missouri, where my fellow citizens deciding to creatively express their liberties under the First Amendment decorated the town with fried chicken boxes, watermelons, and malt liquor bottles. Lest we miss the point they lifted up the N-word with a certain First Amendment vigor. Your CEO, not being particularly wise, I tell that generation 20 years younger than me, turn those cell phones off. We do not want to agitate these people. I need all these devices shut down. Don't film anything. Don't post anything. Let us get in and out of this little town. 
the sheriff declines to provide protection. I'm wondering what I'm going to say to him until I look over and see the president of the Missouri State Conference of the NAACP, Mary Ratliff, in her 70s, marching beside her husband in his 70s, beside 17-year-olds and 7-year-olds. I'm watching them march in the ice and in the storm and thinking about her prophetic spirit, thinking about her understanding of Martin Luther King, thinking about her embodiment of King's ideals. When that sheriff told me, I'm not going to protect you. You can't walk through my town. You might as well get on your bus and drive around. Well, thinking about that prophetic vision, these are the words I told him in not quite a shaky voice. I've been in touch with the Attorney General, and unless you allow me to walk through your little town unharmed, you explain to him what happened to my people, but you got five minutes to move, and I suggest you move now. That's not my voice. That's the voice of a prophetic spirit. When you Look at an older generation, and a, a generation less experienced than you are with respect to social media and social advocacy, a generation not well versed in the challenges you're grappling with, but a generation that has survived. Your mama's generation, your daddy's generation, your grandparents' generation, yea, even the generation of a few professors and a few deans. Or maybe, like me, you look at somebody like Mary Ratliff and think about Dr. King and you say to yourself, I'm going to be brave, I'm going to be courageous, I'm going to stand up, I'm going to fight, I am not going to give up and never give in because I will stand on the side of justice no matter what, even if it costs me my life. A prophet who were he alive today would be in his 80s by the name of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, if a man has not found anything for which he's willing to die, he is not fit to live. There is a generation of older folks who gave their lives for what little we have. And I'll just tell you how I think about them. I ask myself this question. If they did all that they did with what little they had, why, why, why can't I do more with all that I've been given? It doesn't mean we don't question our elders. It doesn't mean we engage in some kind of generational deference. When you come to the table of truth, your truths have to stand on their own two feet. You may have tenure, you may have a social security check, but when it comes to the fact that African American men are 21 times more likely to lose their lives at the hands of the police when it comes to the fact that there are 2.3 million Americans behind bars, 100 million Americans with some form of a criminal record, when it comes to the fact that we have a generation of young people who have been criminalized, when you enter that debate, it doesn't matter if you're the president of the NAACP. It doesn't matter if you're a United States senator. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of a company. What does matter is do you have prophetic spirit and are you willing to make a prophetic sacrifice? That's where we are. We have to listen to one another. But it does not mean we have to grant one another automatic deference. President Exdale can tell you. Within the NAACP, we are a profoundly democratic organization. That means if I say something that doesn't quite hold true, I got some 15-year-olds and some 75-year-olds 
who will get in my face. And from talking to your president, I gather in the conversation that lasted over an hour, I think maybe you got in his face too. <laughs> he lived to tell. But the text also tells us that Isaiah, Isaiah, when he encountered the Lord in this vision, was reminded of his brokenness, his fragility, his woundedness. Isaiah says, I'm a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips lips. That means we as prophets are not perfect. We as prophets have to have a certain moral humility. We as prophets have to come to an engagement recognizing that every claim has to be tested. Every moral assertion has to be tested. Oh, I'm not talking about the First Amendment. You can go over to the law school and hear about that. I'm talking about something more profound than that. It's called moral discourse. When you sit down with somebody that you violently are opposed to, who represents everything you stand against, and you decide to use one of the most powerful words in the vocabulary of our republic, love. Somebody's saying to me, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. You okay until you, until you got to this part. No, no, you, you, can't, you can't be serious. When you have somebody drive past you in a pickup truck, with the license plates removed, wearing a ski mask, threatening to shoot you repeatedly. You have to assume, if you're possessed with a prophetic spirit, that the person with a gun, with an intent to kill, with an intent to harm, is a fellow child of God. I'm not speaking about a theoretical possibility. I'm speaking about what I've seen in my freshman year at the NAACP. As a black man, I can't drive anywhere with a broken tail light, a broken signal, a bad paint job, a nice car, a suit that looks too nice, without having some police officer pull me over and ask me 99 questions. My being a citizen, not being one. But when I have my fellow citizens driving pickup trucks with the license plates removed, driving past police cars who are ostensibly there to provide protection to the NAACP, and they threaten to shoot you repeatedly. You've got to ask yourself, am I going to preach my religion? Am I going to preach social justice? Or am I going to live social justice? I say to you, if we can love people who threaten to kill us, perhaps we can love one another when we merely disagree. If I can get an amen from the back row, I'd appreciate it. Flawed, but cold. Flawed lips, flawed arguments, flawed intentions, flawed behavior, flawed demonstrations, flawed, but cold. Can I give you another example? Sophomore year, not quite first semester, we look at the state of the Voting Rights Act. 
In the wake of Shelby versus Holder, the Supreme Court decision which gutted the coverage formula, weakening Section 5, making preclearance difficult, making it difficult for the Justice Department to ensure that we have fair voting. We see all across the country a Machiavellian frenzy of voter disenfranchisement. We're not talking about black and white disenfranchisement, nostalgic disenfranchisement from 1965. We're talking about multicolored disenfranchisement in 2016. Here's what we're saying. We're talking about African Americans being turned away at the polls because of irrational and uneven voting ID laws. We're talking about closing down polling places at the last minute. We're talking about making it more difficult to vote, not merely for African Americans and Hispanics, but also people with disabilities and seniors. We're talking about my mother who when she was 16 years old and went to college and stood up for her rights and participated in civil rights demonstrations, being knocked down by a fire hose at 16, 50 years later she calls me up and says, son, you went to Yale Law School, I live in Georgia, they're requiring all of these IDs, I can't find my passport, I no longer drive, how will I vote? Is she being discriminated against based on her race, on a disability, or her age? And so the NAACP faced with this choice. How do we stand up for the right to vote? Your flawed Foible Field CEO announces a march from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. Again, we had real serious geography problems. The Klan in South Carolina, being a very indiscreet organization, made clear that they were not going to have us march through Greenville. So though yours truly announced that we're going to march 867 miles, we got it off. We were off by about over, mm, mm, close to 400 miles. The journey ended up being 1,002. We marched from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. Flawed, but cold. We announced a march in the middle of the summer, 104 degree heat, 114 degree heat index, 85 year olds, 75 year olds, 65 year olds, 17 year olds, college students, high school students, middle students, flawed but cold. We didn't have all the money we needed to have. We didn't have a great PR firm. We didn't have any pollsters telling us that we could get to Washington, but we knew we were flawed but called. Called by God to stand up for justice, to stand up for righteousness, to stand up for the least disease, to stand. <laughs> flawed but called. This millennial generation we have august writers in America's leading newspapers declaring that this, this generation is a petulant generation with a certain kind of finger-wagging arrogance. They say to you, you're upset over little things, trivial matters, hypersensitive as to all manner of racial and ethnic and religious and gender slights. Content yourselves to pursue your degrees. Leave this activism alone. They say to you, you are not in a position to mount a movement. You can tweet, but you can't speak. They say you can post, but you can't protest. I submit as Exhibit A, a group of young people in Ferguson who took out their cell phones, filmed an 18-year-old boy lying on the pavement for four hours by the name of Michael Brown. They took that image, that selfie, that ussy of injustice and sent it 
via geostationary satellites and fiber optic cable and wirelessly all around the world, so much so that they put the words Michael Brown on Barack Obama's lips in Geneva. You did that. You're flawed, but called. You don't have all the answers, and neither do we. We too are flawed. We too are broken, but we need each other. May I humbly remind you, Tamir Rice was 12. Michael Brown was 18. Walter Scott was 50. Eric Garner was 50. The victims of racial profiling are multi-generational and the opponents of racial profiling have to be multi-generational. We need everyone in this fight and unless we stand together, we will fall and fail together. <laughs> Last point. The prophets among us. Someone's saying, well, wait a minute. Dr. King, that's great for a black and white newsreel of the 1950s and 60s. That's not a YouTube moment that's relevant for me. That's not a Vine moment that's relevant for me. That's not a relevant Instagram, Twitter moment for me. OK. Let's look at the prophet Isaiah. Those of you who are biblical scholars understand that Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, was written by a school of prophets, writing under the name Isaiah. Think about it this way. You had younger, more radical, upstart prophets writing under the hashtag Isaiah. That's what happened. Check the scholarship. You got the radical upstarts. Oh, y'all don't believe this. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you an example. Turn of the century, there was something called the Niagara Movement. Then an upstart, radical, barely well-behaved organization called the NAACP comes along a few years later. Then, fast forward, you got an organization led by a young radical upstart, new to town, by the name of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who starts his own organization, though he was a member of the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So he leads the Joshua organization relative to the Moses generation. Fast forward. You got a young, good-looking, smooth, erudite brother by the name of Julian Bond. They created an organization called SNCC. Because the old guys, the old girls, the oldsters, the geriatric crowd in the SCLC and the NAACP, we've been, we got to eclipse you. Fast forward. You got a Black Lives Matter movement. Young, edgy, tough. To experts in disruptive politics, displacing that geriatric organization called the NAACP. Can I tell you the end of the story? 50 years from now, 25 years from now, your children are going to be saying to you, get the Black Lives Matter movement out of the way. We need some people in here who are young and edgy and radical and who understand technology. That Those BLM people, they got to get out of the way. We got to retire them. Here's the Here's the truth. We all got to be young. We all got to be radical. We all got to be edgy. We've all, all got to test our moral metal with one another. Because be clear, unless we understand that there are prophets among us, you're not doing this work because it's cool. You're not doing this work because it's going to win you any friends. You're not doing this work because it's going to help you pass your exams. You're doing this work because you're caught up with a prophetic spirit. 
You're doing this work because you believe in this country. You believe in justice. You believe that what you do matters. When students, when students at Yale, who by and large don't have criminal records, take a stand against the prison industrial complex, you're doing it because you understand that this era of mass incarceration has to be brought to an end. It's the prophetic spirit. <laughs> there are prophets among us. In the residential colleges, there are prophets among us. In the library, there are prophets among us. Walking across campus, there are prophets among us, back home, with your families, among your grandparents. There are prophets among us. There are those of us who are caught up with the spirit of Martin, with the spirit of Isaiah, with the spirit of Amos. We are caught up in a prophetic spirit, and yes, we are in a constructively militant mood. There are prophets among us. Don't let anybody qualify what you're doing right now. You're standing in the tradition of Ella Baker. You're standing in the tradition of Martin Luther King. You're standing in the tradition of Julian Bond. You're standing in the tradition of W.E.B. Du Bois. You're standing in the blood-soaked, sweat stain, sacrifice, laden tradition of Rosa Parks. That's who you are, and that's what you're doing. <laughs> Don't let anyone engage in moral condescension. And as I take my seat, if you grow discouraged, if you grow weary, I ask that you lift up these words well known by Dr. King and that are kept in the Bonnecke Rare Book Library. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as a rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on. 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 Us march on till victory is won. Good evening, everyone. I have the lucky job of following that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, President Brooks. My name is Risa Nelson. I'm uh, the director of the Afro-American Cultural Center here at Yale. I'm also an assistant dean of Yale College, and I'm also the chair of the MLK 2016 Planning Committee. I res <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
I received a note just a few hours ago from Ms. Caroline Jackson Smith, the third director of the Afro-American Cultural Center at Yale, 1981 to 1989. Uh, she shared her journal entry from uh, MLK Day 1986 and um, her current day reflections, which I thought were just so timely. I recalled Martin Luther King Jr.'s death most vividly on January 13, 1986, during the first of many events I helped plan in honor of this singular moment in our blood-stained history. It was a huge symphony concert in Woolsey Hall. The Howard University Choir began to sing We Shall Overcome. Their full, rich voices filled Woolsey Hall like nothing I had ever heard there. 1,500 audience members joined in and their voices rode upward to where I stood in the balcony. Their voices rose a wave of memory and lost chances and hard-won victories cresting over me, the foam of bitterness in my mouth, my eyes lost. I remember the very first Martin Luther King Jr. celebration at Yale after the national push when we fought for and won the holiday and Yale and the center sent a whole bus to DC to help lobby for it. It was quite a moment. I can only imagine what a moment that was, especially after last semester, to, vision, to, to witness the triumph of and the culmination of the tireless work of students, administrators, faculty, alumni, alumni, and friends in our community fighting together for what only made sense, the honoring of this great rights civil rights leader and the reminder that the work continues. It must, I contest, in order for humanity to survive, King's dream must be realized. I often reflect a bit more on the days leading up to uh, MLK Day, and so I was reading a bit of where do we go from here, chaos or community, in which Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. states, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. On Saturday, I attended a phenomenal film screening of The Price of the Ticket, Karen Thorson's documentary on James Baldwin. And in continued reflection, I was considering Baldwin's relationship with King and other civil rights leaders and artivists of his time and recalled the quote in The Fire Next Time, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once the hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with the pain. In connecting these two quotes, I think, how can we get there and together, past the pain reaching towards love? I can't help but urge myself and others to consider our pain, its sources, how we can find the courage to love through the pain, ourselves especially, so that we can love others. To those who forget King's point of, it is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned an often disregarded but critical point of his I Have a Dream speech. The powers that be made a promise to us all, not just to some, and not just the, power, the promise of hope. It was a sacred obligation, as King noted, to guarantee the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But how can we be happy or even remotely satisfied as a nation when so many of us are crippled by racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, dirty water, failing schools, no jobs, subpar health care, institutions paid to imprison us, and housing we wouldn't even put our animals in, and so much more. How can we be free? How can we live if even the fullness of our dreams don't seem to matter? How? Someone asked at the film screening, what is the price of trust? I was thinking for so many of us, it costs everything. How can we trust each other given our histories? How do we get there? I don't have all of the answers, of course, but we have a conversation. We break bread together. We start there, start there. Who are you? This is who I am. Who are we in this together? And that takes emotion and truth telling and honest and transformative listening and connecting mind and heart and spirit, which is tough for some, and especially in, uh, in academia, it can be something that many can't afford. But lest we be silenced and crippled in complicity, we have to be willing to risk it all and do for love what we thought we would never do. We have to sacrifice the comfort that we, and we know that it's not gonna be easy for any of us, especially if we fear a so-called transfer of power. The cost of not doing so is far greater and the implications of which are deadly. 
It takes learning about our biases and prejudices about social injustices and taking part in civic engagement. Many of you will be attending the Yale Civic Leadership Initiatives Conference on January 30th. I can't wait to hear what you learn about that and to know what you'll do with that knowledge. I know that it will lead to a great deal of work that moves our community. So these are just some ideas, starting ideas for helping our nation make King's dream truly matter and to be realized. Some steps towards the survival of humanity and transformation of this world. But it takes each one of us as leaders, as President Brooks suggested, not always looking outside of ourselves, but seeing and embracing the activists in each of us, in each person, or at least copying to the obligation of just one small action to disrupt distrust, fear, pain, and injustice. And we're all stuck in this together, like it or not. <laughs> And as Lila Watson suggested, if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. This is our obligation to our present and our future, and it is our ticket home. With that, please remember to continue the reflection, the celebration, and the work, and know that you are also invited uh, to join us for the remainder of the MLK commemorative events. Tomorrow there's going to be a public reception for the artists whose work comprise Black Pulp, an unprecedented overview of, 90, of over 90 years of black image production by black publishers, black artists, and by non-black artists and publishers allied with foregrounding the black experience. The reception will be held tomorrow at 6 p.m. at the gallery at 32 Edgewood, and the exhibit continues through March 11th. Also tomorrow, the AFAM House and the Slifka Center will be holding a memorial service honoring James Earl Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner, young, very young freedom fighters who were abducted and killed by the Klan during 1964's Freedom Summer murders. The event will take place tomorrow again at 6.30 at the Slifka Center, 80 Wall Street. The House will be holding a poetry in the House, I mean the Afro-American Cultural Center, the House. Uh, we'll be holding a poetry slam and an open mic on Friday at 8 at 211 Park Street. If you don't know, you should. Performers will have the opportunity to share their uh, poems and work that relate to civil rights movements and social, justices, social justice issues here and around the world. Uh, King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? So we hope that you will respond to that question by participating in Dwight Hall's annual M MLK Day of Service this Saturday, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. To register, you can visit DwightHall.org. The House will also be hosting a celebration of community and spirit that connects us all at the MLK Soiree this Saturday, starting at 9 p.m., again at 211 Park. And lastly, the Black Church at Yale and the University Church in, Christ, in Yale, uh, the University Church at Yale, will hold a joint worship service on Sunday, January 31st at 10 a.m. This will also be held at 211 Park. Please keep in mind that the House, its resident groups, and many campus and community partners are going to be kicking off Black History Month soon. The theme is on roots, rebirth, and renaissance, and we have a lot of great events um, that are open to the community, free. We want everybody to come out. Um, we'll be celebrating black traditions, cultures, contributions to our world, going back to the cradle of humanity to today. And some of the events include the Digital Diaspora Family Reunion with filmmaker Thomas Allen Harris, the annual Black Solidarity Conference, the Black Panthers film screening and talk back with director Stanley Nelson, again the Black Pulp Art Exhibit, the Black Women's Retreat, Rodney King performed by uh, Roger Genevere Smith, uh, All Black Everything, a first annual festival celebrating black life. So please do check for the schedule. It's going to be on our website. It'll be posted in the inner city news, so check it out. And finally, thank you again to President Brooks. Thank you to the MLK Planning Committee for helping bring this moment together. Abigail Troy, Amber Drumgol, uh, Brianna Burroughs, Diane Young-Turner, Gabby Cujo-Wilkes, Ian Oliver, Karen King, uh, Michael Morand, and Kasi Oates, um, Nicole Tinson, Orlando Yarborough, Paige Tucker, Peter Crumlish, and yours truly. <laughs> and uh, many thanks again to the Yale Dean's Office, the Office of the Secretary and Vice President for Student Life, uh, the NAACP, and Ms. Bria Baker, um, and many other supporters of tonight's event and those throughout our celebration. So that is all for now. Go in peace and do good work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dean Nelson. We had a quick conference on the sidebar. I want to bring our guest speaker back to the podium for 30 seconds. Okay. 
I just want to leave you with these words. Thank you so much for your hospitality and your love. And uh, I want to encourage anyone here who may not be a member of the NAACP, <laughs> please join the NAACP. Thank you. And there's a, there's a table in the back where you can sign up. And uh, for those of you who don't do so tonight, you can also join online. Join the NAACP. Thank you, fellow prophets. <laughs>